There was no denying that I'd miss my workbench more than anything else. It was my haven, a place I could retreat to whenever my soul needed mending. Not that there was anything fundamentally wrong with my soul, it's just a poetic way to say there was some unhappiness in my life. Things had fallen apart gradually, so much so that I couldn't pinpoint a specific moment when it all began. I've always been quite handy around the house, capable of fixing almost anything. I loathe the idea of calling in a repairman and shelling out nearly a day's wages for a couple of hours of subpar work. Yet despite my practical skills, I couldn't fix my marriage. The best analogy I can offer is that of a fine piece of china. You can glue a broken plate back together, but it's never quite the same as the original. Similarly, a broken marriage can be repaired, but it can't return to its original state. I didn't want a mended, fractured plate. After 18 years of marriage, my wife Nicole decided she wanted to experience other men, or at least one that I know of. By the time I found out, the plate had already shattered beyond repair. I'm not the quickest when it comes to relationships, so I had assumed everything was fine. We had married right out of high school, and soon after, we had our daughter, Natalie. Due to complications, she would be our only child, but we were content with our lives. My job as an auto body technician paid well, though it wasn't a career with much of a future. I could have opened my own shop, but I never had the ambition to run a business. Money was sufficient, and that seemed enough. Nicole, more ambitious than I, spent her evenings attending classes at the local community college. When Natalie started school, Nicole began working. The extra income was beneficial, and her job positively influenced our family life. With two incomes, we eventually saved up enough to buy a small house in a pleasant neighborhood. There was never any yearning for a bigger or better place. It seemed we were all genuinely happy for many years. Nicole was never one to splurge on frivolous things. She dressed and groomed herself well, but always kept a close eye on her spending. My own wardrobe was limited to jeans and flannel shirts, giving me a perpetually disheveled look, partly due to my bushy eyebrows and long hair, which I wore in a ponytail. It wasn't an attempt to emulate a hippie or biker, I simply liked it that way. No one dared to tease me about it, likely because my considerable bulk was enough to deter them. However, I couldn't shake the feeling that Nicole was occasionally embarrassed when we went out together, though she never voiced it. As Natalie grew older, Nicole dedicated more time to her work in the insurance claims industry, quickly becoming an expert. She enjoyed her job and excelled at it, soon bringing home more money than I did. Despite noticing the shift, neither of us ever mentioned it. By the time Natalie reached high school, Nicole had transformed into a sophisticated businesswoman. Her increased spending on clothing was justified by her rising income. Frequent visits to the beauty salon accompanied her elevated status, and she joined a local gym, regularly spending evenings working out. While she evolved into an attractive, well-groomed individual, I remained the grungy, unkempt embarrassment. Looking back, the next phase of our marriage seemed inevitable. Over the years, my bond with Natalie strengthened, largely because I spent more time with her than Nicole did. Nicole's time was increasingly consumed by her work, both in the office and at home. As her career soared, our family time dwindled. Our personal relationship also deteriorated. Nicole was often too tired, and I sensed that I was no longer the man she once dreamed of spending her life with. I grew up in a public housing project, raised by a single mother who worked as a waitress to support my brother Brandon and me. Life was tough for her, and we didn't make it any easier, constantly getting into trouble. Many of the traits I developed in that environment came with me into adulthood. I was rash and quick-tempered, leading to multiple stints in juvenile hall. Nicole was aware of my past, but since our marriage, I'd managed to keep my temper under control, gradually becoming more placid. As Nicole and I grew increasingly distant, I sought refuge in my basement workshop. Though it was a damp, uninviting space, I found a sense of peace there. Frustrated by the state of my marriage and feeling helpless, I tried the usual gestures, flowers, gifts, and weekly dinners at upscale restaurants with fine wine, but nothing seemed to rekindle the connection we once had. As a result, I retreated to my basement sanctuary whenever possible. Natalie remained the bright spot in my life, 
but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was failing her as both a father and a husband. Was this self-doubt my own doing, or had Nicole subtly imposed it upon me? I knew she loved me and would never intentionally hurt me. To distract myself from these insecurities, I spent hours crafting small electronic gadgets. These were items I could easily buy for next to nothing, but the joy came from making them myself. My first project was a Fox video surveillance camera that panned back and forth with a blinking red light, useless but fun to assemble. Though I couldn't have purchased a similar device for a couple of dollars, it wouldn't have given me the same satisfaction. I even made Natalie a small panic button keychain. Although she never had to use it, she appreciated the thought behind it. As I gained more experience, my projects became slightly more complex, but I never advanced beyond being a hobbyist. On weekends, Natalie and I would visit yard sales and flea markets together. She enjoyed hunting for retro clothes, while I scored for old electronics and remote control toys. Nicole, meanwhile, stayed at home. It was two months ago when I first suspected that Nicole might be cheating. It didn't take long to confirm my suspicions. Every Tuesday and Thursday, during her lunch breaks, she and her co-worker, Ryan Hernandez, would spend two hours at his apartment. While they could have been playing Scrabble or something innocent, I knew better. Ryan was handsome, drove a nice car, and likely possessed charm, education, and skill in the bedroom. What struck me was that Nicole hadn't made much effort to conceal the affair. Whether this was due to complacency or sheer indifference, I couldn't tell. But one thing was clear. Our relationship had reached a breaking point. Realizing the gravity of the situation, I knew something had to be done. I spent the entire day preparing for my departure. Natalie was set to start college in three weeks, and everything was paid up for her first two semesters. Though I would miss her, I felt it was time to cut the apron strings. I took half of the savings account, leaving the rest untouched. I didn't care about sorting out other financial matters. All I needed was enough to get away and start over. Filing for divorce seemed too complicated and pointless. However, I had my lawyer draw up a power of attorney for Nicole so she could sell the house. Additionally, I prepared to sue Ryan Hernandez and Continental Memorial Insurance, where both he and Nicole worked. Though I had little hope for a successful outcome, my lawyer was willing to take a chance for a potential percentage, so I told him to go ahead. I spent most of the evening working on my special alarm device. It had evolved from a simple keychain to a more sophisticated gadget. Despite its small size, it packed a loud alarm. I made several modifications. I upgraded the battery to 9 volts for increased volume and longevity, configured it to be remotely activated, and ensured it couldn't be easily turned off. The device had a 3-inch PVC plastic casing with 20 drilled holes and a small antenna wire protruding from one of them. Once complete, I capped both ends and painted it flat black with BBQ paint, giving it a slightly sinister look. If everything went according to plan, the alarm would beep intermittently until the battery died or was destroyed. I considered making it waterproof, but that muffled the sound too much. Nicole had long since gone to bed, allowing me to stealthily slide my homemade device into the lining of her purse through a small hole I made in one of the side pockets. I figured it would take at least five minutes for her to locate and remove it, which was long enough to accomplish my goal of irritating her before I left. After double-checking my work, I was confident she wouldn't notice the device. I spent the next few hours loading my truck with the things I wanted to take with me. That afternoon, I picked up my body shop tools and my final paycheck. I planned to pack my clothing the next morning after Nicole left for work. With everything ready, I crashed on the sofa for the night. Jason, are you going to work today or sleep all morning? The sun was up and my wife was dressed and ready for her day. Sorry, dear. I got tied up with a little project last night and decided to catch a few hours here. Are you going to eat anything? I'll just have coffee and an English muffin. Okay, I'm heading out. Rinse off your dishes before you leave. She looked good, as she always did. I was going to miss her, at least for a while. As soon as Nicole pulled out of the driveway, I grabbed some trash bags and headed to the bedroom. It took less than five minutes to gather all the clothing I needed or wanted. That was as far as I got before being interrupted. Dad, 
What the hell are you doing? Natalie, aren't you supposed to be at school? I've already met all my curriculum requirements. Don't dodge the question. I put the bags on the floor and turned to face my daughter. Do you want some coffee? Natalie managed a small laugh as we walked into the kitchen. You figured it out, didn't you, Dad? I placed a cup in front of her, trying to maintain my composure. Figured what out? You finally figured out that Mom was cheating on you. What do you mean by finally? She's been meeting with this jerk for over six months now. Why did you wait until now to do something? I only found out about two months ago. Damn it, Dad. It's not like she was hiding it or anything. I was blindsided. I wasn't expecting it, so I wasn't looking for it. By the time I noticed, it was too late. Too late for what? I don't know. I guess too late to stop it. Dad, you can stop it, but you can't undo it. I know, that's why I'm leaving. Did you talk to her? No, did you? Yeah, about two months ago. I asked her why she was doing it, and she just looked at me and said I'd understand in about 10 years. She didn't give you any kind of explanation. Nothing. She seemed annoyed that I even questioned her. Apparently, she wasn't worried you'd tell me since she kept seeing him. For some dumb reason, I think she wanted to get caught. I was thinking the same thing, but why? We sat in silence for a few moments. Do you know where you'll be going? No. What are you going to do? Pound metal, I guess. It's all I know. Are you getting a divorce? No, I'll let your mother handle that. Is there anything I can do to help? Just watch over her until you leave for college. I trust you'll be all right. I tried to take care of everything I could in advance. I'm fine, Dad. You take care of yourself. I picked up the cups and put them in the sink. I never did make that English muffin. What are you doing with your boat and stuff? Do you remember my friend Justin from the project? Yeah, are you still in touch with him? I thought he was bad news. He is, but Justin's the only guy around I trust right now. I need his help with a few things. He's going to take care of my boat. You mean you're giving him the boat? When I smiled, she smiled back. I loved my daughter. Twenty minutes later, I was hooking the boat up to the truck. When I got the boat, I hoped it would be something the family could enjoy together. Unfortunately, it was never Nicole's thing. She hated the boat and the water. Natalie and I went out by ourselves a few times, but it wasn't the same. After that, the boat just sat by the garage. I wouldn't miss it. I had a few shotguns and a deer rifle that my dad had given me before he moved to Florida. Justin would get more use out of them than I would, even though he didn't hunt. I piled all my snap-on and power tools into the back of the boat. Mr. Handyman had retired. Justin was barely awake when I got to his place. He had two mixed-breed dogs that lived with him, but it quickly became apparent that they were not morning creatures. Justin got us an early morning beer, and the dogs went back to bed. When I was 15, Justin and I broke into a golf course maintenance shed. The irrigation system for all 18 holes was antiquated and made of copper. The shed was full of copper fittings essential for maintaining the system. I saw an opportunity to make some money by reselling the copper, and Justin was more than eager to join me. Needless to say, we got caught. Well, I got caught. Justin managed to get away. The cops knew there were two of us, but I always claimed it was just me. I ended up with two years of probation for being foolish, but I also gained a lifelong friend because I kept my mouth shut. Justin was as white as I was, but he insisted on talking as if he came from a rougher neighborhood than the projects where we grew up. There wasn't much difference, but Justin had to navigate a different environment than I did. He adapted to his world, and I couldn't fault him for that. Jason, what the hell are you doing dragging that boat around? Are we going fishing? He smiled and took a big swig from the long neck bottle. It's a present, a gift for my best buddy. You must be talking about me. You ain't got no other friends. The smiles turned into soft laughter. Justin, I'm leaving town for a while, and I need you to take care of my stuff while I'm gone. Are you coming back? Probably not. Then I assume you'll be leaving me the title too. 
He laughed again when I slid the boat and trailer title across the kitchen table and then shook his head. You're serious, man. He paused. I can't buy your boat, Jason. You could get good money for it anywhere. It's a trade, Justin. I'm not selling it to you. I need you to do something for me, or rather, have something done for me. His smile widened. Jason, who the hell do you want hurt? You know I'll do anything for you. Now I was smiling. Not killed, Justin. I just want him to spend some time in the emergency room or the recovery ward at one of the hospitals. Don't kill him. Maim him, cripple him, or just hurt him, but don't kill him. That's a lot of boat for such a little job. Well, if you can, I'd like you to do it every six weeks for six months or until he leaves town. Whichever comes first. Damn, man. What did this guy do? Did he take Nicole from you? As soon as the words left his mouth, he realized his mistake. I'm sorry, Jason. That was my bad. I never did know when to keep my mouth shut. He got up and pulled two more beers from the fridge. I pushed a 3x5 card across to him with the name, address, and license number of Rain Hernandez. Wait a couple of weeks, okay. He looked at the card and then nodded toward the door. The power tools and guns were an unexpected bonus. While I unhooked the boat, Justin took them inside. We chatted for a few more minutes before parting ways. I could trust Justin. A year ago, I would have said there were two people I trusted. Now, it was just Justin. It was Tuesday. Right on schedule, Nicole and Ryan walked out of the company building and got into his Lexus at 11. Knowing their destination, I had no trouble following them to Ryan's apartment. There was nothing intimate, they acted like a typical married couple. I gave them 15 minutes to settle in before hitting the button on the remote control. Nothing happened. The damn thing didn't work. What did I do wrong? I got out of my truck and walked closer to the apartment building, pressing the button again, still nothing. In frustration, I decided to at least let the air out of Ryan's tires. Might as well make myself useful. I deflated the two tires on the side of the car away from the building. Desperate, I walked right up to the side of the building and tried the remote control again. It finally worked. I heard the noise loud and clear from outside. Inside, it had to be deafening. The sound blasted for a second, paused for two, then repeated. Everyone in the apartment complex was now being treated to my little surprise. I was smiling as I walked back to my truck. Even halfway down the block, I could still hear the beeping. Things were going better than expected. My lawyer was set to deliver lawsuit papers to Ryan and the company at 2 o'clock. I'd be far gone by then. When I got home, Natalie was waiting for me. She handed me a card with her college address and her cell phone number, which I already had. She unpacked a few extra things I had missed and even made me a lunch so I wouldn't have to stop until I was out of the state. We both laughed and hugged over that. I left the power of attorney and my wedding ring on the kitchen table. Natalie assured me she would explain everything to her mother. My body shop tools were stowed under the bed cover in the back of the truck, while my personal belongings were cramped behind the seat in the cab. As I pulled away from the house for the last time, my cell phone rang. It was Nicole. I turned it off. Though tempted to hear her out, I refused to give her the satisfaction. Interstate 81 South was my chosen escape route, and I didn't stop until I reached Chattanooga. I ended up at a CE motel, which unfortunately had a bar next door. Big mistake. I drank far too much, and while sleeping it off, some local boys helped themselves to my body shop tools. The back of the truck was cleaned out, although they left the cab untouched. Perhaps they ran out of room or had a smidgen of integrity. After a shower, a shave, and putting on fresh clothes, I had a much-needed breakfast at the local Waffle House before heading to Nashville. I was kicking myself for being so careless and mentally planning my next steps. Without tools, finding a body shop job was out of the question. I settled in at a nearby Crystal's and began scoring the help-wanted ads. Most jobs were low-wage or commission-based sales positions. None were suitable until a small, three-line ad caught my eye. Wanted. Auto damage appraiser. Must have body shop experience. Conrad Insurance Company. I turned my cell phone on, called the listed number, and secured a name, address, and appointment in one hour. 
I noticed five missed calls from Nicole, deleted them, and punched the address into my GPS. I always like to be early for appointments. Realizing I was not dressed for a job interview, I accepted there was no time to change. What they saw was what they'd get. When I arrived, three other guys were already there, all dressed sharply and holding folders I assumed contained their resumes. Each one entered the manager's office, stayed for about five minutes, and left looking disappointed. Feeling good about my chances, I figured I couldn't do worse than they did. The man behind the desk was well-dressed but clearly not suited to his attire. His hard, cracked skin and faded tattoos visible through his clothes caught my eye. Most striking were his calloused and gnarly hands, just like mine. This guy wasn't an executive, he was a metal beater in people clothes. He noticed my smile and gave a sort of smile back. He swiftly read through the interview form I had filled out in the lobby. I had left many spaces blank, not out of defiance, but because I simply had no information to enter. Miller, Jason Miller. He paused as if collecting his thoughts. No, I am not, I said, anticipating the unspoken question. Just as I had countless times before, I clarified that I wasn't related to the famous author. Well, that's a relief. I wouldn't want any intellectuals hanging around the office, he remarked, visibly relieved. It seemed he appreciated not having to ask directly, possibly sparing him embarrassment. A proud man, no doubt. I hear that question a lot, I added. My name is Kevin Thompson. So, why are you here, Jason Miller? His straightforwardness left no room for pretense. Having seen three slick talkers dismissed in record time, I knew better than to try and con this man. I got drunk last night in Chattanooga, and while I was sleeping it off, someone swiped all my shop gear from my truck. It's tough to get a shop job without tools. This seemed like a good alternative. Fair enough, but I suspect there's more to the story. Am I right? Yes, sir. I just discovered that my wife of 18 years has been cheating on me. My judgment was clouded last night. I usually don't drink that much. Where's your wife now? Pennsylvania. With a booming voice that carried through the office, he called out, Lauren, bring us two coffees, will you, hon? Lauren appeared, a mid-forties woman on the heavier side, wearing too much makeup. She set down two cheap, white ceramic coffee cups with no cream or sugar, just black coffee, straightforward. Kevin gave her a light pat on the backside as she turned to leave. Cancel the rest of the appointments, babe. I think we found what we were looking for. Lauren shot Kevin a scowl but gave me a wink, causing me to smile sheepishly. Kevin noticed and grinned at my discomfort. We chatted for about two hours, during which he meticulously explained the job's responsibilities, pay, and benefits. The only downside was the image requirements. 80% of my job would involve customer interaction, so image was crucial. This meant a haircut and a complete overhaul of my grooming habits. I was expected to get a new wardrobe and a shoeshine kit. He emphasized that point. Lauren would personally assist me with everything needed to look the part. I was expected to be in Atlanta by Monday morning for a full week of training. Conrad Insurance was an independent company, subcontracting for several larger national auto insurers. Everything had to be done to specific standards. While the company covered all training expenses, the cost of new clothes and grooming fell on me. Lauren seemed to relish the task of getting me ready more than I did. I was her little project. While I insisted on visiting a barber shop instead of a hair salon, she made all the other decisions. Not only did I get a haircut, but my eyebrows, ears, and even nose hairs were meticulously trimmed. Lauren informed the barber that I would be returning every 10 days for the same treatment. My new work attire was fairly generic, chalky pants and white shirts. She even found a jacket that matched the pants. I also acquired two pairs of black, steel-toed dress shoes and a dozen pairs of black socks. She found a small studio apartment for me and helped set it up. Friday morning, I got my Tennessee driver's license, and that afternoon, Lauren handed me the keys to my company car and a laptop. Before leaving me at the apartment that evening, she stood on her tiptoes and kissed my cheek. Damn it, Jason. If Kevin wasn't so darn jealous, I think I'd have to jump your bones. You cleaned up real good boy. 
I was flattered, but her suggestion sent a shiver down my spine. It was time to call Natalie. Dad, good to hear from you. Where are you, or is it better that I don't know? Baby, I'm in Nashville right now. Please don't tell your mother. Are you working? Actually, yes. I got hired at the first place I applied. I guess they will always need body men. Actually, it's a desk job. Well, not exactly behind a desk. I'll be doing appraisals out in the field. How the hell did you land a job like that? I guess I was in the right place at the right time. How are things at home? Well, I'm fine, but Mon's a wreck. I thought she'd be happy to see me gone. So did I, but it's quite the opposite. Care to expand on that a little? All she did the first day was sit at the kitchen table, chanting over and over, that is not how it was supposed to happen. Did you question her about it? She was drunk and unresponsive. Every time I tried to talk to her, she just looked at me and repeated the mantra. After about an hour, I gave up. She drank every drop of wine in the house. At least she didn't touch the hard stuff. I wasn't expecting that. Me either. I thought she'd be pissed. It seems like she had a plan, and I somehow messed it up. That's what I thought too, but I can't figure out what she expected to happen. She must have known she'd get caught eventually, but maybe she didn't anticipate you leaving. It looks like she was gearing up for some kind of confrontation. I'm sorry if I disrupted her plans. There was a brief pause in our conversation, and I took the chance to change the subject. What are your plans? As soon as mom calms down a bit, I'm heading to school. If I get there early enough, I can take a few summer classes. Part of me hates to leave her, but another part of me is desperate to get out of here. At least she's stopped chanting. Well, I'm leaving for Atlanta tomorrow morning. I'll call you when I get back, okay? That's fine, Dad. I'm glad things are working out for you. Mom is strong, she'll snap out of it eventually. The training sessions in Atlanta were straightforward. Most of it involved correctly filling in various forms. The hardest part for me was overcoming my weak computer skills. I had no trouble getting a few of the younger female trainees to tutor me, but found it a challenge to resist their charms, much to their apparent disappointment. The next two years flew by. Kevin was very pleased with my job performance and rewarded me generously with raises and bonuses. I kept in regular contact with Natalie. She was doing well in her classes and enjoying her social life. While it was nice to hear she was dating, as a father, I couldn't help but feel a bit anxious. She laughed at my concern. I never heard from Nicole. She made no effort to contact me, even though I hadn't hidden my location. She sold the house and used the proceeds to prepay Natalie's tuition before leaving town. Nicole called Natalie every few weeks, but their relationship never went back to what it was before. I had to give Nicole credit for trying. Natalie had no idea where she had moved and never asked. Nicole never filed for divorce. It seemed we were both capable of a long standoff. My social life took on a whole new dimension. I never considered myself a ladies' man but a combination of my upgraded appearance and newfound marital freedom seemed to change that. Technically, I was still married, but considering the circumstances, it didn't feel that way. Nashville was brimming with young women seeking companionship. I always made it clear up front that I was married and not looking for a serious relationship. Surprisingly, this honesty turned out to be a major plus, even with some married women. I made it a point not to date any of the married ones more than once and never took them back to my apartment. With single women, the only rule was making sure they understood I wasn't husband material. Kevin had hired two more guys to do what I did, and I ended up training and supervising them. There was plenty of work to go around, but I sensed something was brewing. Jason, we need to talk. Kevin's tone was serious, which worried me. Those were the dreaded words wives used to spring bad news on their unsuspecting husbands. Kevin laughed when he heard me groan. Don't get too worked up, Jason. It's not that bad. It's a hell of a way to start a conversation. We both laughed. Jason, I hate to say this, but you've outgrown this job. What the hell does that mean? You can do better. I have no complaints about your performance, but I think you should consider moving on. 
So, you're firing me? No, damn it. I'm trying to push you forward. Lauren entered with two cups of coffee without being asked. Leaning over, she whispered in my ear loud enough for Kevin to hear, the old farts worried you might steal me away from him. Don't worry. If he lets you go, I'll follow. This time, it was Kevin who groaned as Lauren left the office giggling. It was a daunting thought. Jason, I have a job interview set up for you in Houston this Friday. American Consolidated Claims needs someone to run their national operation. They're struggling to find the right person to manage their appraisal section. I've already talked to them, and they're eager to meet you. That's nice, Kevin, but surely they have some young college graduates with business degrees who are more qualified. They tried that three times already. So, what's in it for you? I don't get it. In about four years, Lauren and I plan to move to Gulf Shores. ACC has agreed to buy out my business when I'm ready to sell. Oh, I see. This isn't purely out of the goodness of your heart. You're using me as a bargaining chip. Exactly. See, I always knew you were smart. Both of us shared another laugh at his devious yet transparent attempt to push me forward. Thursday night came, and I was on my way to Houston. I wasn't keen on relocating, but everything Kevin said made sense. I opted to drive rather than fly. I arrived at American Consolidated's sprawling office building, where they occupied three entire floors. They were expecting me, and I felt no nerves. I knew I could handle the job and was ready to confront anyone who doubted my qualifications. The fact that their MBA employees had previously failed at the position bolstered my confidence. The first two interviews went splendidly. During the third, one of the yuppie middle managers began inquiring about my formal business education. His boss quickly shut him down, which made me smile in appreciation, albeit with a hint of irritation. The final hour was spent with the human resources director, discussing salary and benefits, as if my acceptance was already a given. Truthfully, by then, it felt inevitable. Turning down the offer would be difficult. It was lunchtime, and my host was eager to show off the company cafeteria. The floor we were on was as vast as a basketball court. Offices lined the perimeter, with cubicles filling the center. I think you'll enjoy working here, Mr. Miller. I think I will, Miss Taylor. American Consolidated Claims seems like a top-notch organization. It'll be interesting having two department heads with the last name Miller. Be prepared for some occasional confusion. You don't have any relatives here in Houston, do you? No, I'm an only child. No brothers or uncles. The head of the records department is a woman. You don't have any distant relatives named Nicole, do you? Her question caught me off guard. Before I could respond, I saw her across the room. Only her shoulders and head were visible, but there was no mistaking it. It was Nicole. Her hairstyle was different, but she looked radiant. She was engaging a small group of employees, clearly in charge. As I walked, captivated by the sight of my wife, I stumbled into a mail cart, causing a minor commotion. Straightening up, I noticed Nicole looking directly at me, a bit startled. Seizing the opportunity, I hurried off the floor. Is something wrong, Mr. Miller? Miss Taylor asked, concerned about my clumsiness. No, I just wasn't paying attention. I was admiring the layout of the operation. The elevator ride to the lower floor felt interminable. Upon reaching the cafeteria entrance, I turned to Miss Taylor and extended my hand. It was an odd gesture given the situation, and though she seemed taken aback, she accepted it. Miss Taylor, thank you for your help this morning. Everyone was incredibly gracious, and the opportunity you've presented is fantastic. However, I must regretfully decline your offer. Please extend my apologies to everyone I interviewed with. As I quietly left the floor and the building, Miss Taylor stood there, stunned. It was indeed a great job, and I was almost certain that, in time, I would regret turning it down, but not today. I still had feelings for Nicole, and being so close to her on a regular basis would be unbearable. Why hadn't she filed for divorce yet? When she finally did, I hoped she would revert to her maiden name. Kevin was going to be upset, but I'd deal with that when I got home. Twelve hours later, I found myself back home. Surprisingly, Kevin was more apologetic than angry. Sorry, Jason. I had no idea your ex worked at ACC.
I sat across from his desk and smiled as Lauren set down two cups of coffee. I wondered how he had even found out. There was no way you could have known, Kevin. It's nobody's fault. If I had any guts, I would have taken the job and faced her. As you can see, that didn't happen. That doesn't make you any less of a man, Jason. There was no way you could win in that situation. I probably would have done the same. I'm sorry if I'd shepherdized your deal with them. Kevin chuckled and set down his cup. No problem, Jason. They still want it, and the deal is still on. Life continued as it had for the next few years. Natalie graduated from college and married a nice guy from Cleveland. I made it to the wedding just in time to walk her down the aisle, but I didn't stay. Nicole was there, looking beautiful. It was extremely difficult to avoid her, but I did. Natalie was disappointed that I didn't stay for the entire day, but she said she understood and was glad I came. I was happy that Nicole could see her only daughter get married. To fill my spare time, I started taking college classes. It made more sense than hanging out in bars. Most of the night school students were older, and a few of the ladies were more than willing to step in where the bar scene left off. Kevin was happy to cover the cost of the classes. Eventually, the time came for Kevin to retire. All the terms of the sale had been finalized, and given my expressed reluctance to stay with ACC, Kevin arranged an interview for me with a firm in Chicago. While I wasn't thrilled about relocating there, Kevin assured me that the employment package was exceptional. It didn't quite make sense to me. After all, there were plenty of MBA graduates vying for prime positions. When I arrived at the Universal Amalgamated Insurance Building, I was promptly taken to the 18th floor. The name on the door was familiar, Daniel Garcia. Upon entering, I recognized him as the executive from ACC who had defended my qualifications during my interview there. Seeing him was a pleasant surprise, warming my heart to see that qualified individuals were being rewarded for their efforts rather than over-educated, over-qualified types. The first 30 minutes of the meeting went exceptionally well, but then things took a downturn. Mr. Miller, I was quite disappointed by your abrupt departure after our discussion in Houston. When I learned more about the circumstances, I could somewhat understand, but not entirely. I apologize for leaving like that. I just wasn't ready to face the ramifications that came with the job. Handling difficult situations is a key responsibility of a good executive. Have you found a way to overcome that shortcoming? I'm older and more mature now. I believe I can handle myself much better than I could a few years ago. I need to be certain. I have a lot of confidence in your skills, otherwise you wouldn't be here. I've arranged another interview for you, but before you go, I have one question. Naturally, I was a bit anxious and confused. I nodded, signaling my readiness for his question. Nicole Miller kept a small glass dome on her desk. Inside it was an unusual black object. She never explained to anyone what it was or why she kept it there. Many of us speculated, but we never figured it out. I have a feeling you might offer some insight. The question and his manner of asking it made me uneasy. Why was Nicole being brought up now? What connection did she have to this interview? His seemingly simple question about the keychain alarm felt unsettling. Mr. Garcia, did Nicole Miller relocate to Chicago when you did? Mr. Garcia, a portly man, leaned back in his chair with a smile. Of course she did. I value good employees and have no qualms about recruiting them from other companies. Nicole is one of the strongest executives here. She's with us, and I will do everything possible to keep her. I need you to compliment her. Together, you'll make an unbeatable team. I stared at my feet, shaking my head slowly with a smile. There was no escaping her. The first time might have been a coincidence, but this felt like a well-orchestrated plan. Jason, you never answered my question. What is that black doodad Nicole keeps on her desk? Mr. Garcia, that black doodad, as you call it, is a small item I made for my wife before we separated. I have no idea why she keeps it or feels the need to display it. That's all interesting, but what exactly is it and what's its purpose? I decided it was time to end the interview. Though it was his decision to make, I felt the need to take control. That's something you'll need to ask her, Mr. Garcia. A hint of concern crept into his expression as I stood up. Mr. Miller, will you at least talk to her? 
Before making any decisions, please talk to your wife. I noted a touch of desperation in his voice, which seemed out of character. He was a strong, dynamic man, and his hesitation didn't fit. My simple act of standing appeared to unnerve him. He was by my side as I walked out of his office, his mouth moving, but his words not registering. He spoke faster as he guided me to her door, which bore only her name, no title, no position description. Nicole Miller We all must face our demons eventually. It seemed my time was now. Garcia was still talking as I entered her office. I didn't knock. Her hair was perfect. Her makeup was flawless. Her suit and accessories were impeccable. She was older, but more beautiful than I remembered. She raised her head and looked at me from behind her desk. Over the years, I found myself fixated on the wrongs she'd done, and my image of her grew increasingly tainted as my resentment deepened. Yet the fact that I still thought about her as often as I did was a clear sign that deep down, I still loved her. I hated what she had done, but my love for her never entirely vanished. As these thoughts swirled in my mind, I realized I was standing there, slowly shaking my head. It felt like I was trying to deceive myself. Her voice snapped me out of my reverie. Chasen, no one told me you were coming. What are you doing here? She started to rise, but I gestured for her to stay seated. I took a seat across from her, unsure how to begin the conversation. You look well, Chasen. Better than the last time I saw you in Houston. This was not the discussion I had anticipated. How was I supposed to respond to that? There was no way I was going to compliment her on her hair or dress. It was a game I wasn't willing to play. Mr. Garcia asked me here today to explain the doodad, as he calls it, on your desk. Her hand instinctively moved toward the glass dome, but then she stopped. That's bullshit, Jason, and we both know it. He offered me a job. Again. He was disappointed when you turned him down in Houston. I didn't respond. I just sat there, not knowing where this conversation was headed. I wanted to talk to you, but you were gone before I got the chance. Why would you want to do that? At the time, I hoped I could explain things to you. Now I realize there was nothing to explain. It was all pretty transparent. I started regretting coming to see her. I was trying to figure out how to leave without looking like a total jerk. But why should I care? Jason, did you ever want an explanation? There is one thing I'm curious about. Her expression invited me to continue. Why did you keep the little alarm? It reminds me of how stupid I was. I look at it and know that one mistake can ruin a whole lifetime. You only slept with him once. No, that's not what I meant. Nicole, before I leave, can you give me a reason that doesn't sound like a tired old cliché? Probably not. You gave an explanation to Natalie. Yes, but that was before it was too late. What does that mean? When Natalie confronted me, nothing had happened yet. I just sat there, staring at her. This conversation was going nowhere near where I wanted it to go. Somehow, I was going to have to listen to her recount what happened and why. I didn't want the details. If she insisted on telling me, I was going to demand the Reader's Digest version. Up until about six weeks before you left, all Ryan and I did was spend time together. We had lunch, watched a few movies. Ryan knew what I was doing and agreed to help me. None of it was his fault. What the hell are you talking about? It was a plan, Jason. A plan I came up with to make you jealous. Well, not exactly jealous, but to get you to pay attention. What are you saying? I was buying you flowers, taking you out regularly. I thought I was doing everything you wanted, and now you're telling me it was all my fault. That wasn't what I needed. I sat in silence. It was never your fault, Jason. I didn't realize it until after you left. Only then did I understand how wrong I was. Damn it, Nicole. You're babbling. What the hell are you talking about? I'll start from the beginning. When Ryan started at the company, I immediately noticed him. He was well-dressed, well-groomed, well-mannered, everything you weren't. So, that's when you decided you wanted him. No, that's when I decided I wanted you to be like him. I never wanted him, it was always you. But I wanted you to look like him, act like him. Just like you are now. 
Okay, then what happened? I knew it was bad in a marriage for one person to try and change the other. A good marriage depends on each partner accepting the other as they are. If I tried to change you, the marriage might go to hell. But if you decided to change yourself, that would be different. Okay, that's the first thing you've said that makes sense. When I started openly spending time with Ryan, it was so you'd notice. I hoped you'd either confront me about it or figure it out and take action. Take action? What does that mean? I was hoping you'd get a haircut, a regular one, like you have now. I wanted you to start dressing better and be more attentive, but it never worked. I never knew. I know, the horrible thing was that Natalie figured it out and confronted me. She didn't know why, but she knew what I was doing. Ryan and I hadn't slept together yet, so I didn't feel guilty, but I was annoyed she questioned me. I was wrong there too. I messed up with both my husband and my daughter. You slept with him? Yes. It wasn't his fault, it was mine. I know it takes two people, and he could have stopped it, but he didn't. I sat silent. I didn't have anything else to say or ask at the moment. About two weeks after Natalie confronted me, Ryan and I were alone at his apartment. We were drinking wine, which you know is bad for me. I felt miserable that you hadn't figured it out yet. One thing led to another, and we ended up in bed. We avoided each other afterward. I acted weird at home because I blamed everything on you. I made love to another man because I thought my husband didn't care about me. Really stupid. But you didn't end it. I was so depressed by then that I needed to talk to somebody, and Ryan was the only one available. A week later, we started making love regularly, and then you finally caught us. But it was too late. I'm truly sorry I was so slow. Maybe if I had figured it out sooner, everything would have been fine. You're being the smartest now, Jason. It doesn't suit you. Were you ever planning on stopping? By that time, there was no plan. It was just day by day. It was time to go. I sat quietly for a moment, trying to come up with some clever remark, but nothing came. It was cruel and unnecessary what you did to Ryan. Why is that? Ryan never did anything to deserve what happened. He never tried to seduce me or disrespect you in any way. He didn't try to take me away from you or break up our marriage. All he did was what I asked of him. He made a few bad judgment calls. Now he has to walk with a cane for the rest of his life. It wasn't fair, Jason. Yeah, well, walk a mile in my shoes and then tell me that. That was about as clever a response as I could muster. Tears welled up in her eyes as I stood, and I heard an audible sob as I walked out the door. Eight hours later, I was back in Nashville. Needless to say, Kevin was disappointed when I gave him the news. However, he did have a very nice severance package for me. I called Natalie and told her about the conversation I had with her mother. I suggested she make an effort to contact her, but she didn't seem too responsive. A week later, I left Tennessee with a new pickup truck and a comfortable bankroll. I ended up in Yuba City. Samuel Wilson had decided to sell his auto body shop and move to Hawaii. Knowing the business, I was confident I could run the operation and still send Samuel and his wife a nice retirement check every month. The shop was a clean operation just outside of town, and it included a small two-bedroom cottage in the back. It was all I needed. The business came with ten employees. I kept six and let the slackers go, figuring I could hire new ones as needed. I considered burning all the suits I had accumulated, but decided to donate them to the Salvation Army. They had a job interview program, and the suits would be handy for someone in need. My mustache grew back with vigor, happy to be free from the constraints of the past few years. In no time, my hair was long enough to tie back. The business flourished, and I felt like my old self again. Things were going great, until the week before Christmas. When I arrived at work that morning, a small wrapped package sat on my desk. I stared at it for a moment before calling my foreman in. What the hell is this? I asked. Don't know, boss. A lady came in early this morning and left it there. She said she'd be back at lunchtime. I sat there for a long time without touching it. I knew exactly what was inside that damn box. There was no doubt in my mind. What I didn't know was what I was going to do after I opened it. 
I grabbed a hot cup of black coffee and stared at the box for a few more minutes. Finally, I began unwrapping it, oddly careful not to tear the paper. My foreman returned and saw me holding the black plastic object dotted with about 20 tiny holes. He seemed mesmerized as I twisted and turned it between my fingers. What the hell is that, boss? he asked. I set it down and leaned back in my chair. I'll tell you after lunch. Thank you for watching this video to the end. If you liked it, please like it and subscribe to the channel. See you soon.